21 years ago, when I first came to Lake Superior, I went kayaking at the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. And I was on this really big lake in this really tiny boat. And I thought, oh my god, this is the biggest lake in the world, and I'm in the smallest boat in the world. And I am terrified. This is pretty scary. And I was right about all those things. It is the biggest freshwater lake in the world, and it's one of the scariest lakes in the world. But my next thought, boy, this lake is so pristine and so remote. And I was dead wrong about both those things. This lake may be remote from many big cities, but it is at the absolute core of Anishinaabeg homelands, and it has been for many, many generations. Its waters are intimately connected to distant places because atmospheric currents bring chemicals from China's building boom. They bring pesticides from Russian and African fields. What is most global, building booms, global markets, industrial farming practices, become as local as possible as they accumulate within the fish that swim beneath our shores and in the waters that we drink and as they gather on the plates that we eat. And right now, we are facing one of the biggest challenges of our lifetime, and that's the challenge of climate change. Climate change is actually causing our lake right here to warm faster than possibly any other large lake on Earth. I have a friend who's a really somber scientist, John Burns, and he told me, Nancy, the climate change scenarios predicted for Lake Superior utterly boggle the mind. I mean, that's not how scientists talk, right? Utterly boggle the mind. What he told me was that we face the risk of a migrating climate if we don't control our emissions. And what that means is by the end of the century, we could basically become Oklahoma by August. And I'm sure Oklahoma is a wonderful place, but I want to live in the North Woods, not Oklahoma. But what I'm here to tell you is that there's real reason for hope. And paying attention to the story of Lake Superior's past, which is not a story of pristine, untouched landscapes, but a story of resilience and recovery, offers us hope and concrete strategies for a resilient future. So after I fell in love with kayaking and got over a little bit of that fear, I bought a tiny little cabin, 10 feet by 20 feet, right outside of the Apostle Islands. And I didn't put in running water or anything, because I figured well, there's plenty of water right in front of me. Who needs running water? But each morning, I go five months of the year and sit out there with my cup of coffee. And this bird comes for a visit, a pileated woodpecker. And if I'm lucky, the next bird that comes down is a bald eagle swooping from the winter's ice pack, swings down and grabs a lake trout to feed the chicks in the nest just down the lake. Many days, eight young floater male loons swim by, practicing their calls. And it turns out loons need a lot of practice before they sound like the loons of our dreams. And then, if I'm really lucky, we can hear at night the howls of the wolves that are denning in the county forest just across the road. And you know, many days, bears come by, and they are so common now, they become a pest. And what's really cool about all these species is that nobody expected any of these critters to make it here. 50 years ago, when I was a kid, none of these species were around. They had all almost gone extinct. And people thought that's the way it would be. We'd had a century of the fur trade, which pulled out the beaver that had helped create our watersheds and our ecosystems. Then we had some of the world's most intense mining, followed by deforestation faster and more intense than any the world has ever known. That was followed by failed farming attempts and erosion like this picture of Wisconsin that devastated both the streams, the fisheries, and the many human cultures that depended on those fisheries. And after the 20th century began, things actually got a little worse for a while there. Many communities around the lake who hoped to build jobs for people who'd lost their jobs from the failure of the early industries, encouraged pulp mills to cut the last of the remaining trees. And those pulp mills brought jobs for a little while, but they were allowed to pour their effluent, their waste products, right into our watersheds. 
and those chemicals accumulated in the fish that we now eat, and that combined with distant chemicals from the new post-World World War II chemical boom, DDT, PCBs, all the ones you've heard of, all this began to accumulate in our lake. So by the 1960s, when I was a little kid, the lake was at a tipping point. Many people thought we were about to become another Lake Erie, and it was doomed for us. So the story that I think we need to learn is a story of amazing recovery. We didn't become a collapsed Great Lake. Instead of only seeing these kind of stumps when we go to our parks, beautiful as they are, we see resilient, young, healthy, growing forests with cores of old growth. We see fish like this. The lake trout are amazing. This is one of conservation's great success stories. Lake trout almost went extinct because of invasive sea lamprey and habitat loss. And now they spawn abundantly in the lake again, which is so amazing. And, you know, it's not a complete recovery. The forests are different. Women have to worry about how much lake trout it's safe to eat when they're pregnant. We have a new mining boom underway, driven not by local demands, but instead by Asian demands, largely. But those jobs that might be brought about by the new mines, each community has to balance when the possibility of toxic pollution. So everything isn't perfect, but there's still an incredible story of resilience and hope that can guide us in the future as we face this new challenge of climate change. And climate change is of particular importance for lots of reasons. It can threaten our health, it can threaten our resilience, but one of the things it also does is so many of the toxic chemicals from around the world gathered in Lake Superior and accumulated here, and they were buried in the sediments and in the soil, so they became relatively safe. But now with climate change, we have new storms stirring up sediments. We have new invasive species like zebra mussels and quagga mussels in the lower Great Lakes that love warming water, and they also recirculate these contaminants in the water. And so the stories of the past may become our future again unless we figure out how to create a more resilient future. You know, why does it matter? I had a friend ask me in New York City, it's like, ah, Lake Superior, who cares? And I said, you should care, right? We're 12% of the world's fresh water right out that door. I mean, that's amazing. So the head of a basin that contains 20% of the world's fresh water. Now, Mark Twain, quite a while ago, said, bourbons for drinking, waters for fighting over. And what we don't want the world to do is to fight over our water. We have a resource that will be of incredible importance in the future. This basin alone is 90% of the Americas fresh water surface water. So it really matters what we do right here because we're at the head of a basin. Because we're so far to the north and still a relatively cold lake, contaminants actually gather in this water. We have what's called a really long retention time. Much of the year, we're still covered by ice, right? And what that means is a drop of water that falls in the lake stays for a really long time. We only have one little outlet at the Sault Ste. Marie. So on average, a drop of water sticks around for nearly two centuries, 191 years, compared to Lake Erie, which is just a matter of months. What that means is that a contaminant can stay almost as long. So whatever we do has repercussions for the rest of the Great Lakes and the world. And what this also means is contaminants such as toxaphene, which is kind of a wonderfully named chemical, back in the days when they named things honestly, right? So toxaphene was banned three decades ago, and it used to be used just on cotton. We don't have a lot of cotton around here, right? It's still too cold for cotton. But toxaphene is rising really quickly in our Lake Superior fish, even though the chemical hasn't been used in the U.S. for decades. And that's partly because it's still being illegally used in Russia and Africa, and it's partly because the old chemicals, every time they plow the soil in Mississippi and Alabama, those chemicals bounce up into the air like grasshoppers, get rained down onto a lake, the evaporation bounces up, rains down, and then when it hits our lake, it's cold 
and it acts like a big sponge, a big sink. It sticks around. We've become a sponge for many of the world's contaminants. The interesting thing, though, is people realized this was happening a long time ago. It wasn't like everybody sat around and said, oh, great, let's just pollute all we want. Jobs are all we care about. Starting in the beginning of the 20th century, a lot of people in our communities right here said, you know what? We don't want to become the world's toxic dump. We want jobs, but we also want water for the future. What can we do about it? They saw this pulp mill pollution and said, that's not we, what we want for our children. So they came up with two really important ideas. One, that dilution is the solution to pollution. That didn't work so well. Basically, they thought the lake is this huge bathtub. You stick a drop of poison, and it just vanishes, like water when you pull the plug in the bathtub. But the second key idea was really powerful. You probably haven't heard of this. It's called assimilative capacity. And what that means is a recognition that humans are part of natural ecosystems. It recognizes that in healthy watersheds, healthy forests, say a deer goes out and poos in the woods, the entire ecosystem isn't falling apart for the rest of history. Natural ecosystems can break that down, can assimilate that bacteria. Healthy ecosystems can break down our pollution. And so early planners said, we are part of natural systems. And we can just figure out how much the landscapes can assimilate. But what they didn't realize at the time was at the same time they were pouring new pollution into the waters, they were ripping apart the watershed connections that formed the basis of our watershed's ability to break down pollution. You know those beaver they pulled out of the system? It turned out those beaver created wetlands which absorbed carbon, absorbed pollution, and broke it down. Those forests they chopped down so quickly, those forests were grabbing pollution and carbon from the air, pulling it down into the roots and holding onto it in the soil. So when they made those huge landscape transformations, just when they most needed the ability of our landscapes to heal, they pulled it apart. And scientists such as Rachel Carson began to recognize this right in the mid-1950s. There'd been a bunch of nuclear testing right after the war. Those data were classified. The military wouldn't let anybody see. And in 1954, it was declassified. Carson and a lot of other scientists went out thinking that near the Pacific Island should see really high levels of contamination and radiation. And then they went and measured in the Arctic, the Sami people, the Alaskan people, the reindeer, and thought, there won't be any contamination there. But they found the opposite. In the Arctic and in Lake Superior, they found really high concentrations of these radioactive isotopes. So it turned out distance wasn't protecting us, that bioaccumulation and biomagnification meant these chemicals and contaminants were working their way up the food chain until they ended up in us. And Carson said, pay attention. And two local women, looked at one of the biggest developments that had just been approved in our watershed, the reserve mine processing plant over in Minnesota. It was dumping 400 million tons of waste products from taconite, a form of iron mining and processing, directly into Lake Superior. And the state had said, ah, big bathtub, it'll be fine, it'll break it down, it's all natural. And these two women said, you know what? We just read Rachel Carson. They read Rachel Carson. They thought, she's a woman. We're women. We can do this. So they stepped up and said, you know what? We don't think that's such a great idea, dumping all this stuff in the water. And they talked to some scientists who said, you know what kind of fibers those are? That's what we call asbestos in those tailings. And so Arlene and Verna went to the International Joint Commission in Canada and said, do you know they're dumping asbestos in our drinking water just upstream of Duluth? And the scientists said, oh, don't worry about it. You're housewives. What do you know? And so Verna and Arlene, instead of shutting up, they took on the world's second biggest mining company. They went and they talked to scientists. They talked to union members. They talked to tribal councils. They talked to fishermen, they talked to the brand new EPA, and they never gave up. They pushed and pushed, and eventually they shut down that processing facility. They didn't destroy the jobs. They made them dispose of their waste in clean inland facilities. And so what can we learn from these incredible lessons? 
Three key things. One, never give up hope. Arlene and Verna didn't. And the second key lesson is Arlene and Verna persevered by talking across boundaries. You know, housewives talking to scientists, Canadians talking to Americans, tribal members talking to commercial fishermen, unions getting involved, Republicans talking to Democrats. And they realized that for all the things that divided them, what brought them together was their love for the lake. And the third biggest lesson is what gives us hope, what we need to restore are those ecosystem connections, the healthy wetlands, the healthy watersheds, the healthy forests. Because fundamentally, Carson, Verna, and Arlene were right. We are all in this together. Thank you. <laughs>